What's going on, Wolfpack and BDG family? Welcome back to a special episode of Market Watch Mondays. As most of you guys know, I retired from the game, but I had to come back for this interview that I had set up with the legend himself, Matt Harmon, the founder and creator of Reception Perception. If you don't know what that is, I highly recommend you go to the website and check it out. In my humble opinion, it is the best uh, form of content when, as it relates to wide receivers on the internet today. So I've been I've been paying and subscribing to Reception Perception for a long time. Back to back when it was part of Footballers. Uh, now Matt kind of pulled that out and is doing his own thing. Partnered with uh, James, another legend in the industry. They have a dope website, a lot of charting, a lot of analytics. Um, but uh, you know we'll get all we'll get into all that. But before we do, Matt. The man of the hour. How are you doing? How's it going? Uh, drafts coming up. You, you know, you said you're getting a little bit busy here, finishing up some of your charting. Uh, what's what's life been like so far these past couple of days? I mean, clearly I've been pretty busy. I missed your retirement announcement. <laughs> so shout out to you. And I feel a lot of pressure now to make this like a good show. Like, uh, you know, it's like you don't want to be um, you don't want to be Brett Favre coming out of retirement and doing that year with the Jets. You want to be Brett <laughs> yeah. Favre coming out and that that one good Vikings yeah. run. That's what we want this show to be. So yeah. hopefully that's what we can do over the next hour. But yeah, man, things are good. Uh, obviously, just super busy time, you know, with the draft. And I'm actually getting married in like 23 days, depending Congratulations. on so um beautiful time like to just mess my entire life up with uh, it's a whole ton of work with the draft and then like all of the other charting stuff and then oh yeah got to do this whole big life event thing too <laughs> so things are good life is awesome uh and uh yeah i'm, I'm very excited to talk uh, everything with you tonight man that that's awesome uh congrats on the uh, upcoming wedding uh how long have you guys been together if you don't mind me asking We've been together for over three years now. Uh, and so obviously most of it during COVID. Um, yeah. And uh, then we got engaged, but we got engaged like in July. I think it was, Ju yeah, it was July, 2020. I should know this, but like off. <laughs> head, it's July, July, 2020. So uh, it all kind of blends together. Right. But like, yeah, we, so we've been together for a while and we didn't like, uh, you know, get, have a wedding pushed because of COVID or anything like that. We wanted like to kind of put, we wanted to like put that off as long as possible. And now suddenly it's like, this thing we've been talking about for a year and a half now at this point is like, well, oh, man, it's, it's here, which is, which is wild. That's incredible. Uh, dude, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I also started dating my current girlfriend, like, you know, at the beginning of COVID and it's like relationships that started in COVID is like totally different. Cause we live together too. So like you literally yeah. spend like Same. all your time together. It honestly feels like, uh, and I, I mean this in a good way, uh, like even though we've only been dating for like three years, like similar to you guys, it feels like we've been together like for much longer Forever. because yeah. of like all the time we spent together. But it's, that'll put your relationship to the test. Um, for sure. And, for sure. Uh, yeah. People told because we actually got engaged. I'm from uh, Virginia, North Carolina. We did like a cross country trip. Uh, back there to see like my family you know during kind of i get that summer of 2020 we're like well we're not gonna find a plane like you know too much let's just do let's do this instead uh to kind of do my annual voyage back there to still to make it happen and you know, everybody's like well man if you could drive across the country together uh you know you're 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 destined to be together I'm like buddy we live together every <laughs> yeah. day during the like the heart of like quarantine yeah. in, in LA, like especially here, you can't, you know, you couldn't go and do anything. Yeah, for yeah, the I'm in Cali time. too. So, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's just like if we were to, you're to, like if you're in a relationship, like yeah, you're together together. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, together. I totally know what you mean. Yeah, that's how you know she's the one, man. Uh, so congratulations exactly, on yeah. that. No doubt. Um, <laughs> all right, folks didn't come on here for a dating show, uh, but you know that was just interesting that you know kind of started dating same time. So that's a little fun tidbit for you guys there. Uh, so everyone knows you as one of the honestly best personalities on Yahoo. I love watching your interviews with players, and uh, you know you guys kind of funneling off each other. Uh, maybe just give the the people a really quick quick intro of like what you did before like fantasy. How did you? get into fantasy you obviously didn't start off as a big star in yahoo you know you started off you know wherever you started but how did that journey take you to where you are right now yeah so uh yeah i'll try to be as brief as possible with what feels like kind of a long story but uh basically like when i graduated from college my life plan was to go back to school and uh like pursue an academic career like get a phd um like continue the work that i had done as an undergrad like with my senior thesis all that stuff um and then you know that year I, but i decided to take a gap year and that year away was a lot of chaotic points of life that uh, i've talked about in previous shows before and stuff so um 
you know, it just kind of needed like an outlet to, to do something that I was passionate about. I always loved writing uh, and I always loved football. And, you know, people would always say, you should start a website. You should, you should do this stuff. And uh, so I had all the time on my hands possible to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed it so much doing the site Backyard Banter, which is still active. Uh, Backyard Banter is still uh, up and live. Like, you know, just doing random stuff like, uh, fantasy rankings that nobody cared about or read like power <laughs> team power rankings that absolutely nobody read or cared about. Uh, I loved it so much. I was like, you know what? I'm 22, 23 years old at the time. Uh, if ever where there was a time to completely like take my life plan, throw it in the trash, uh, like now was the time to do it. So uh, for the next couple of years, I still, you know, worked in basically like super, super low end, like social work jobs. Like I worked with, you know, at, at risk youth. I worked with um, adults with intellectual disabilities and stuff like that. It was like, I mean, some pretty heavy stuff, but then at nights I would stay up till like 3 a.m., uh, working on this thing called reception perception and like basically uh, put that out there to the world. And, you know, one thing kind of led to another, I got a gig at football guys, which was, you know, kind of the, the uh, that like at the time was the dream for me. Cause I, you know, grew up like in yeah. the, in my formative years of football, listening to like Sigmund Bloom and Matt Waldman, Cecil Lamy and those guys, and just, you know, just admired the hell out of them and stuff. So uh, I get, got a little gig there. That was kind of my first paid thing, you know, freelance with like the Washington post for a little bit. And then somehow some way ended up getting a job at NFL network as like a low level, like writer editor. Uh, and, you know, just kept doing more like the you know, podcasts and, and eventually TV stuff with all, all my guys there that I'm, I'm still friends with. And, and then eventually made the jump to Yahoo just cause it was kind of the right move at the time career wise. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's like the best way to sort of speed round through uh, yeah. what was going on until until the Yahoo point. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Uh, you see, so you've been with all the all the OGs and uh, all the legends. Uh, so you know, people out there it doesn't come in easy, man. You gotta you gotta put the work in. You gotta put the grind in. Matt's obviously done that more than most. Um, all right, I want to move on to put some football stuff here. So every single off season, the Twitter timeline is filled filled and plastered with film versus analytics i find <laughs> the extreme sides of both incredibly annoying you know i personally yeah. live in the middle i know you kind of obviously balance both did you start off more as like a numbers guy when you're in your early writing days or did you start off as more of like a film guy like how did you learn to watch and appreciate film like how did you learn what to look for uh what trace look for like in your wider series film review like where did you get all that from because that you know, obviously that doesn't come from the social working background. You have to like learn right. that by yourself. Right. So where does that background come from? Yeah. So I would say actually that a lot of what I do with reception perception was kind of like a natural fit with what uh, I, I did in school with like, uh, I was a sociology major. And uh, so that's why I never did anything good with my degree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, but like, so basically kind of like taking an observational science, like trying to put some quantif like quantified reality behind it, something to, to beef it up and make it like you're, you're, you're like an observational science, but trying to put that to some sort of quantitative formula yeah. was really kind of made sense to me. So um, I started off as definitely obviously more of a film person, you know, that's, and I would say that I sort of blend both worlds in that way. And I think that's kind of why I like to meet in the middle as well. I find myself to be like a super centrist on any sort of like hardcore football debate mm -hmm. um, on, on, up to a certain point. Uh, but like, yeah, so I obviously, like I said, you know, following guys like Matt Waldman and Sigmund Bloom, you know, those guys are hardcore, you know, watch the tape bros. Uh, and I'm, I'm comfortable saying that because those guys are my friends. So like they're, you know, <laughs> hardcore watch the tape bros and stuff like that. So that's where I was at. But at the same time with reception perception, I wanted to have like, a clear way to show and um, you know, keep yourself honest too. Cause the biggest thing that I think is like, you can sit down and watch like, you know, something over and over and over again, but your brain's not always going to categorize that the right way. You know, mm -hmm. you might say like, Oh, you know, if, just perfect example. Like I'm, I'm charting Calvin Austin right now. Uh, and, uh, or I just finished that up today. And he's like a, you know, he's like a small receiver, this fast guy, whatever, but he, win he wins a decent amount of ca contested catches for a guy like his size, you know, and like, but not to a point that it's like a strength of his game. It was still like something clearly you'd be like, all right, at the end of the day, he's a smaller player. Like, and so like I, you can get wowed by the amount of like some of these really cool contested catches he makes for a size, but like, man, this guy's a good 50, 50 ball receiver despite his size. But probably I would say it's like more of an average trade just based on the actual charting number. So mm -hmm. that's why I really liked doing that part of it, like charting it out myself. And then as I was working on 
uh, cause I, you know, kind of finding out about football, like read a lot of books. Um, the, and the biggest one was, uh, Pat Kerwin's keep your eye on the ball. That's like the first thing I tell anybody, if they're going to like watch film, I would just read that book and like, kind of just start to re- realize what you're looking for and like how to watch stuff and then grow from there. And, you know, he just put a, a lot of examples of like charting and things like that. So I was doing that for multiple different positions, but really just fell in love with the wide receiver aspect of it. And then it was kind of the challenge of like, how can I take that and uh, make it information that people might want to read and be and be like digestible and um i feel like we've gotten to a pretty good place with that but yeah so that's kind of a, I, I would say definitely more of a film guy but i i find like the debates about it to be so exhausting <laughs> and, and yeah like if, if we're still doing that at this point you know come on yeah but the, but the off season doesn't start until those debates uh, start on twitter is what i've that's learned true, yeah. uh, over the past years I, I think you know what i really love about the product and you know for someone like me that comes from the number side i don't understand film as much like i can watch a player and say hey that guy's pretty good but i can't do what you do and kind of chart everything's out. What I really love about the product is it takes like the film aspects and it puts it into a language that folks like me can understand. Like you tell me they're a 93rd percentile player against man press coverage. I can understand that. Right. I don't necessarily understand, you know, like uh, when he stems his routes and when he does all this and that, but, but, and I also, frankly speaking, like I don't have a big interest in doing that, but using your data, it can tell, it can build a profile for me as a player, which I can combine with other data points uh, from their production perspective and build a really, really cool profile for wide receivers. So that's what I really love about your product, about the reception perception thing. Uh, so, you know, this year, obviously, or sorry, this past And I think year, on the other side, like to put it on the other side too, like yeah. I think that by just doing the work and putting it out there, I can also go on someone's podcast that's like just a total tape grinder yeah. and talk about players in an educated way that I feel good about and like never even say the word percentile or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I like to, I like to think that it can, that's why I just like to think that reception perception kind of bridges the gaps between uh, both sides, but obviously no, not everybody's going to agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I, absolutely. I think, you know, when I first started in fans football and I was learning about stuff, so I used reception perception. You were like my go-to guy for like wide receiver film analysis. And then I used Graham Barfield's like yards created data for running backs. And that yeah. those two combined like really gave me uh, the basis to kind of form opinions on players in addition to the analytics side. So it, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a crazy journey. I remember there was a period where you didn't have access to like a college film anymore. And I was so sad because I couldn't, I couldn't I get reception. Me reception. Both. I couldn't yeah, get yeah. reception perception anymore. So we're happy that it's back. It's got a new home uh, reception perception, the in- own website. Uh, so you just started that, you know, used to be part of the ballers who are obviously, you know, OGs and legends in the space as well. Uh, but what has that process been like just pulling that out of ballers and kind of having your own, you're working with, with James as well, who's obviously, uh, you know, another legend. Um, but you know, what are some of the struggles you guys have had? What are some big milestones you guys had this year that you've uh, been able to celebrate? Yeah, I think that the pro, I mean, there, there's no like big, juicy detail about like leaving the footballers or something like that. It was just kind of like, I, honestly, there was a bit of a, and, and I feel pretty comfortable saying this, like uh, there was really more of like an issue from the Yahoo side of like, cause I, I'm in a bit of a weird situation, right. Where like, yeah. I'm still a full-time employee with, with Yahoo, like, and I'm, I'm, you know, working there, but I also run my own website on the side. Yeah. But it was also then th- that was actually sort of the compromise of like, when I went to Yahoo, I had an existing deal with the fantasy footballers to produce reception perception content from them, uh, which I struck because I was on kind of a weird structure at the NFL uh, network. Mm-hmm. So that were, that was fine, but that was kind of like, all right. So I go to Yahoo and they were like, all right, that's okay. That's fine. Whatever you're doing this thing in some draft kit. That's cool. But then like, you know, three years into working for Yahoo, they're like, you can't work with the fantasy footballers. <laughs> like that's a big competitor. So really, honestly, it's like a shout out to those guys that they grew yeah. their, you know, presence and platform so much that, a, you know, a, provide, a provider of a fantasy game like Yahoo's like, yeah, you, you can't be working with, with them boys anymore. Like, uh, <laughs> so we kind of came to the compromise that like, I'm going to produce this, you know, on my own and kind of see where that goes. And yeah, it was, uh, look, it, it's, it's a weird thing because obviously I knew that people like reception perception and you know to some degree i knew it was not like an idea coming out of nowhere but it's always still risky to kind of put something out there yourself and yep. you know something that i obviously care a lot about uh so really it was just kind of and then james coming on was a total like accident we were texting about something else and you know i was like hey man i'm actually because we're obviously we're, we're friends and mm-hmm. and i was like yeah i'm actually thinking about starting a site uh for rp and he's like let's, 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 let's get on the phone, like, and talk about some stuff. So he ended up coming aboard to kind of help out on the stuff that like, I 
don't care about, which is like, oh, you know, things that are important, like business, business stuff, <laughs> and, you yeah. know, and like bringing people on board to do things behind the scenes, that type of stuff. So he's great about that, filled in a lot of gaps for me that I, I don't know what I would have done otherwise. So, um, yeah, James is the man. And obviously, you know, with a content background, like ex as extensive as his, yeah. easy to just like jump on videos and stuff together. We have great chemistry. But yeah, man, I think that the first year of the site was big success. I feel really great about where we are. And I'm just excited to kind of like, decide what more I want to put into it and um, you know where it's going to be in three years and five years and uh, you know I, that's the thing that I guess is the is the problem with me Mike is like I mean it's probably I guess it's a good thing and, and whatever but I'm I'm always like man there's more I could do like yeah especially when it comes to charting players there's always there that's where you have to have like a hard you know, I mentioned the top of getting married like if you want to get married to somebody get your get to the point where somebody likes you enough to want to marry you you can't chart like every damn receiver in the league, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 or every incoming prospect. So um, there are certain like, all right, I got to put, put certain limits on myself, but the fact that people like, you know, subscribe and, and pay for it and it's like just its own product now, it makes me want to work like that much harder and make it that much better. Yeah. I mean, that, that definitely just validates your work. You know, when it, it's all cool when you're on Twitter and you're doing stuff and you're writing free articles or some other, someone else's site, but when you like isolate yourself, and then there are paying customers. That's when I was like, okay, damn, like I need to deliver. Like I feel very motivated yeah. to do stuff. And it completely changes the game. Cause like, you're like, you're, you know, even though you don't like the business side, you are a business owner. Now you have partners, but you are a business owner. You're not just selling a site. You're selling a product. Uh -huh, yeah. you know, people are coming to your site for you, obviously. Um, Dan, that's dope, man. Congratulations on that. Uh, I, as soon as I saw you were breaking out, I'm like, okay, I'm immediately buying this uh, because, <laughs> because it's, it. it's, uh, it's definitely the best out there. Um, let's get into a little bit about your reception perception process. So, uh, obviously like the, the reason why I respect this work so much is I, I understand how much time it takes. Like you said, you cannot possibly watch all the film. Anyone else that says they watch all the film is lying to you. There's not enough hours in the day to do that. So yeah, no. Yeah. So what is your process? Like, like how do you select which games to watch, uh, so that you get a, a, a breath, uh, large enough to form an form a basis on a player like what does that process look like do you just like pick one good game one bad game or or like how do you know where to, where to look it's so funny that you mentioned like the time that that you know the time it goes into it because i actually feel like i thought everybody knew that but then when i started this on my own i was like people definitely don't understand like how <laughs> how long this takes and uh sometimes i don't now i have a pretty good grasp of how long it takes like especially that, this uh last year when we started the site you know with, with the footballers like we dropped like I, I dropped like 50 guys data in the in the tr in the draft kit every single time at every single point every single year um but now like i came out with kind of like a wave format which you obviously know that it's like mm -hmm. free agents come first and draft prospects then guys that like are in their first year second year that type of stuff which I think helps my workload a lot uh, in like managing time. But yeah, folks, I, I think we're like, oh man, I don't, I don't really think people know. Even James, like when he first decided like to come aboard, he's like, I, and he, this is true. He told me like in 2015, after my first year at NFL, when I kind of sat him down and talked about reception perception, he's like, this is like going to be the best product out there. And like, whenever you do like really go all in on this, I want, I want in on that. And obviously now like five years later, it's a good, good thing that worked out but he was like i did not understand how much freaking time you put into this until until now like you know all this time later so it does take a lot of time and i would say though that the the just the process part of it you know i, I always do eight game samples for for every player as long as that's you know they've got eight games available it is harder for college players now because you know I, I do have access to college tape but not like full access so yeah. for some of these guys like you know sky Moore does not have an eight game sample on the site but so Usually I want to get eight. I want to get eight games for everybody, for anybody that's not hurt in the NFL. They always get eight games. And uh, I always try to do three games inside, like three divisional games. So for Packers players be, you know, Vikings, Lions, Bears, um, though, I try not to watch the as much as much film as I can avoid from the Bear Stadium. <laughs> uh, you want to avoid that because they've got this weird, like all 18 angle, or at least they have in years past. Uh, but that's like a weird, like tape Twitter joke that like, only people that watch a lot of film would, would understand. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, three games from the division. And then I always do try to mix in like a, a bunch of productive and uh, unproductive games. Like, you know, some guy goes crazy, like for 200 plus yards. I'm going to want to check that game out. Um, also, you know, games against higher level of competition, like really good cornerbacks or something like that. I want to check that out as well.
Yeah. Okay. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I like the I like the fact that you pick like in game divisions because like in in division games are always so different because like you have so much yeah. history with that team. Like even games you think should be blowouts all the time like aren't necessarily that way. So it's just a very interesting uh, sample size. That's a really interesting tweak that I haven't um, I haven't heard before. Um, if we look back right through reception perception, there's been a lot of good players. I mean. If I think back to some of your greatest hits, you know, Calvin Ridley comes to mind, Tyler Lockett comes to mind, uh, Stefan Diggs comes to mind. Like in, in your eyes, like who is like who is your your like per- reception perception hall of fame? Like it doesn't have to be the best players, but like it, it could be defined however you want to see. Like maybe maybe the biggest sleepers that you picked out that no one else cared about, or or maybe they're they're absolute stars, like a like a Stefan Diggs, for example. Who would be your like top three guys that you think back? You're like these guys are on my mantle. I uh, uh, Joe Holka, who I do a show every week during the season. He he calls it like the reception perception penthouse or something like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that I think that's what he calls it. But yeah, uh, so st- I think Diggs has to be on there because um, yeah. he's just like that was just a, I think a great success story. You know, he's like a fifth round pick and just, you know, right away has good RP data. And obviously then, you know, in 2017 uh, was, that was the the first year he, the first, not the last, but the first year that he led the entire NFL in success rate versus man coverage and press coverage. And it was just like, it took like four more years for him to get to the bills in 2020 and then have that like unbelievable season. So that was one that just like, I felt great about. Um, he also is a player that like, I've gotten to know over the years too. And like, I have the video posted on the homepage of reception yep. perception of like showing like back, you know, I, I, we joked about it. The most recent time we talked, it was like, we were a couple of like goofballs and, you know, like uh, I was, I was young and like kind of nervous to talk to an NFL player at that point. It was like, Oh, but was just this, <laughs> like the methodology called her. He's like, yeah, he's like, when I'm like, you're the best though. He's like, that sounds right to me. And then, <laughs> you know, we've t- <laughs> so he's a great That's guy, awesome. all that stuff. And Alan Robinson, I think, is the other one because he was like oh, the yeah. first hit, you know, like back uh, w- when it was still writing reception perception content on backyard banter. Like, and again, he's another player I've gotten to know over the years. And was I remember telling him in 2015 or after that 2015 season, I was like, dude, honestly, if you hadn't done what you did last year, my career would probably be totally like in a different place. So shout out <laughs> to you for that. Uh, so I think he's there. And that, that last spot, the third spot probably has to go to Tyler Lockett. Cause he was yeah. another, like, he was a slow build, not in the same way that Diggs was. Cause he Diggs was good. I mean, Lockett was like, I was way too early on that one. I was in 2016. <laughs> I was like, you got to take this guy the fifth round pick. And that did not work out. Uh, but then like it ended up turning around. So I feel like the slow burn with him there. Um, it, it leaves me hope for guys like, you know, I mean, Curtis Samuel had like a, a a good year as like a rusher receiver type in 2020. I feel fine about like that, that call or whatever. Uh, but you know, some guys like that maybe might take a little while, you know, uh, might take a lot of shit. Can I, can I, can I curse on the show? Yeah. yeah you can do a, whatever. Say all right, you cool. Want. Yeah. I mean, it might take a lot of shit for guys like Brandon Ayuk last year or something like that. But like, listen, I, you know, number, number one, you know, this from the subscription packages, there's no, uh, there's no tier where Kyle Shanahan returns my phone calls and tell me he's going to like be in the doghouse or whatever. Unfortunately, we can't offer that one, but yeah, it makes me feel good. Like, all right, guys take a little bit of time, you know, Lockett took a little bit of time. So I think I'd give him the third spot. Yeah. Whenever I think of, honestly, whenever I think of Tyler Lockett, I think of you. Cause I think I remember that profile you wrote about him uh, back in the day. And I was like, this, this makes sense. And I just, I just kept accumulating. Even when he was everyone, even when everyone hated him, I was like, I'm just gonna keep adding Tyler Lockett. He's free. He looks like a good player. And then, you know, obviously it paid off eventually. I'm still going to do the same with Brandon Ayuk. I have not given up on Brandon Ayuk. We don't understand what Kyle Shanahan does, but we do know, or we have a good sense that he's a pretty damn good player. So I'm not giving up on that either um i want to talk a little bit about like the, the certain traits that you break it down so for those of you guys that don't know haven't seen reception perception uh matt has a really cool diagram like a graphic that shows all the different routes that receivers run and they're color coded uh and there's two charts one is like their success rate which is you know how often they win on those routes and the other is usage so how often they get to run those routes uh compared to the average so it's just a really useful graphic and what you want to see is you want to see a bunch of green and that's the beauty that is the that is the grail that everyone's looking for but you know the part that i find the most interesting in all the data across all the reception session data is how you break down the coverages by man by zone by press their success rate versus each and the percentile versus each and how that stacks up against historical things what i've noticed personally and correct me if i'm wrong but those that are very successful coming out of college specifically at man and press is very, very important. Because as you guys know, most programs do not press. Most DBs yeah. do not press in college. And when you get to the NFL, 
everybody presses because everyone's more athletic. Everyone's more faster. So, you know, those that can actually succeed in those. So if you think back to Diggs, you think back to Allen Robinson, you think back to uh, OBJ, Antonio yeah. Brown, all the gods of wide receivers, they were always in like the 90th percentile plus of man and press. Is that kind of how you view it too, what you're looking for when you're building your data? Like, do you, do you really see like stuff when, when someone struggles against press, is that a big red flag for you or are you okay if they're really good in zone? Like how do you balance those things when you're looking at a wide receiver? Yeah, I, I do think a balanced pr approach is the best way to uh, go about it. I will say specifically with success rate versus man coverage and, and press coverage, like those are the two that I've done the most like work on in terms of uh, obviously that's where some of the biggest success stories have come out of. You mentioned I was Robinson Diggs, Lockett. We talked about even um, if I could give like an honorable mention, like John Brown in the reception yeah, perception yeah, hall Smokey of fame, is another, another, is, yeah, another guy I, I really liked. Uh, and yeah. So like the big superstars have typically been like these press man dominators. Uh, and then it was really kind of like the 2000, 17 2018 season I really started paying more attention to you know where guys line up and how that relates to these individual metrics as well uh the, the example I always come back to you know was like Antonio Brown and Juju Smith-Schuster you know there was all these debates on like dynasty Twitter of like which one's you know Juju's better now than Antonio Brown it's like <laughs> I, I don't give a shit about that because like these guys are basically playing like two different positions out there like what yeah. they're doing on the field like ever this is and this is why I, I do all this work and really it's like to address my own crazy questions but it's like you could throw up a b stats and juju stats and like it's like the way they get there is totally different you know yeah. so like these big slot guys you know cooper cups another example it's like i don't really care if he's pressed on like 12 percent of his routes and he's not the best like press dominator if he's gonna be inside in the, as that big slot player now i think cooper cup has gone along obviously a different developmental path uh, mm -hmm. than a player like juju so that's you know that, but juju skill is kind of like the he's a good big slot receiver. I think people have kind of overcorrected on him. Now I think he's like, he went from being one of the most like overrated receivers in the NFL to kind of being like one of the most underrated receivers. I think mm -hmm. at this point, probably set up for a good year in Kansas city. So, and even more now, because I think the NFL has changed a lot since uh, I started doing RP and really just in the last couple of years, like when you just look at the overall league wide zone rates and, and man rates, like man coverage is down and zone coverage is up. So that was something I wrote about midway through last year. And I thought about like that meme. that's like, this is information that would have been good yesterday or something <laughs> like that. Um, but I wrote about this midway through the season that like, yeah, it's probably time for me even as like the one, you know, I always say that like, I can be wrong about stuff. No problem. I don't think the data misleads us or the data tells us wrong things, but like even my own interpretation of it, it's my data. I can be wrong about that. Or so like some of these really good zone beaters like Cooper cup, who I mentioned, or, you know, Deontay Johnson's good against all forms of coverage, but he's obviously, he was number one last year in, in 2020 in success rate versus uh, zone coverage, you know, obviously like a Debo Samuel type, these guys can, produce like number one receivers because there is so much zone coverage out there now that I do think a balanced approach matters but it will always kind of come back to where players line up and the role they're playing like if you're going to play x receiver you absolutely have to be good against press man coverage yeah. like you can't just be a zone beater and play that x that traditional x spot um and that's why I, I always encourage people to take all of the reception perception data points together you know for I don't know what this has happened a couple of times the last couple of weeks, Mike, uh, I put out my Traylon Burks profile mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, I don't think it's like hideous. He's not freaking Kadarius Tony or anything. So like, <laughs> let's, let's get that straight. Um, but you know, po a couple of like big time, uh, Traylon Burks folks were like coming back at me with like the Jamar chase route chart. And like, they're like, they have the same amount of red routes on the, the graphic. I'm like, <laughs> but bro, like, the way that there's so much more beyond, I can tell you, you don't subscribe to the site. Number one, <laughs> which is fine. Like that's totally fine. I, you don't have to subscribe to the site, but if you're not going to understand the work, like don't post Jamar chase in response to it. <laughs> yeah. It's like the way they got there is totally different. I mean, you know, Jamar chase actually played like ISO X receiver ball in college face press on over 40% of his routes and was a great press coverage receiver. And Burks just mm -hmm. isn't that, that doesn't mean Burks is bad. Obviously, it means Jamar Chase is great, but it doesn't mean Burks is bad. It just means like he's not going to play that role. So I would say like, yeah, you got to take all these, these data points together and balance. I just know like the thresholds that guys have to hit for success rate versus man coverage to really get excited about them. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point is just like it's not just about, you know, the simple metrics. It's about pairing the usage with the metrics together. Like obviously you can find gems like Cooper Cup, like like uh, uh, Drew Smith-Schuster. What I will say, though, is 
I'm always more comfortable betting on someone that's good against man and press because it means they're less limited in their usage, right? That that's what it comes down to. If you know, if someone yeah. can only beat zone, it can only run out of the slot, like there's definitely a role for them there, but they're not as like you know wide and their opportunity is not as great. So that that's kind of well, I think Juju is the best example. Like the guy was putting up some awesome numbers, but got passed up by Deontay. Got pa- and I know people that hate Deontay Johnson think it was just because Ben's like you know, arm fell off or whatever. <laughs> Give me a break with that. But like, you know, Deontay and like even Chase Claypool at certain times pass up Juju on the depth chart because like you mentioned, it's just, it's a limited application player. Yeah. Um, so I want to maybe dig into uh, the the draft class here a little bit. Um, so you mentioned Traylon Burks, you know, I, I viewed all the profiles. Obviously he struggled a lot uh, versus uh, press coverage, uh, man versus press. And he also didn't, didn't run versus press very much because again, we go back to college dude is big and he's fast. Like most DBs aren't going to be at the line jamming them, right? They want to play it safe. They want to play it back. Um, but when you look at this 2022 class in its entirety, uh, you know, it seems like everyone's a bit down. Obviously there's no Jamar chase in this class. We know that. Uh, so there's not, there's not that like super superstar, but to me, there still seems to be like a general, you know, pretty good pool of assets. What is your view uh, on this class as a whole? Like, you know, if you were to look at the top five players, like, uh, how, how do you think they they stack up against, you know, prior years? Yeah, I think if you're just looking back at last year's class, uh, I don't think this year is as top heavy as that, but I think it's still a very good class. Like we were talking about this in the RP Discord today. You know, I think Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddle, and even Devontae Smith would be the wide receiver one in this class. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you're kind of like, my next two guys were Bateman and uh, Elijah Moore. I think that's where you're kind of starting to get into like, do I like Drake London or Chris Olave more than Rashad Bateman or are they, how close are they? So I think like, that's kind of the territory that these guys should, I think that helps people like, and it take, try to take out like what Devonte Smith be, was in the NFL or Jalen Waddle was in the NFL and think about it just as like pure prospects. Like mm-hmm. I kind of think that all of these guys, like my top five in this class, which, and my top five would be Drake London, Chris Olave, uh, Garrett Wilson, Jamison Williams. They're, I think a tier to themselves. And then I kind of want to cheat and put like Traylon Burks and, tier one B and then start my tier two receiver just because yeah. I think Burks is such a, a, a tough eval. Yeah. Uh, so I think like these guys, again, those, those like top four guys, top five guys, they'd all be kind of mixed in that uh, Bateman, Elijah Moore zone for me personally. And then it's like, I don't really know. I don't really know what the hell to do with freaking Kadarius Tony. But <laughs> whole other thing. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's kind of the way I'd view the class. It's not as top heavy, but still a very good class. Yeah. I, I agree with you there. Um, I, Drake London has been, you know, Traylon Burks has gotten a lot of heat, obviously Drake London also getting a lot of heat. You know, people say he can't separate. That's why he's always in contested catch situations. You know, he played at USC, you know, soft coverage, not good defenses. What is your eval on Drake London? Personally, I love Drake London because from yeah. a production per- perspective, he was elite. You know, he is he, from an age adjusted experience, adjusted production. He was slamming before he went out uh, due to injury. So that's what I care about most. Um, you know, I, I've always obviously read your profile, but maybe break down for the viewers a little bit. Is that a misconception that he can't separate or is that, you know, kind of like spot on? I think it's a misconception. Um, is he a Devonte Smith type separator, Elijah Moore type separator, Jalen Waddle type separator? No, but you know, uh, that that's fine. You know, 73rd percentile success rate versus man coverage. That's the same area that Jamar Chase was in, last year, uh, where he's really great. 93rd percentile against zone coverage uh, and then 68th against uh, press coverage. Like that's fine for a receiver like Drake London. You know, he's certainly not, um, you know, I think it's funny that like Traylon Burks gets the heat for, or, or doesn't get the heat for not being able to separate. Cause I think Traylon Burks is like a pure zone beater. And I'm, I'm not really not trying to bag on a bag on him i just think like the profiles are so different the way it's not it's i think discussed it should be kind of similar um drake london i think you know he could be maybe like a 50 50 slot outside player i think he would be an awesome big slot you know for somebody because he is so good against zone coverage um and he his best routes you know the slant the curl the flat like he could just crush teams inside on those routes especially with the way he can high point balls and it comes back to again why I do reception perception, which like you said, you, you see, you watching like YouTube cutups of a guy, you know, from the broadcast angle and you see a lot of contested catch. You're like, Oh man, this guy is, you know, he's not getting open. Well, trust me. USC quarterbacks su- uh, 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 <laughs> last year, not like Jahan, not Jahan Dotson's Penn state quarterbacks, bad, 
but pretty close to that bad. Like they, you can get thrown into a contested situation. Um, and obviously the broadcast angle doesn't show that. And then your mind basically takes the information and fills in the gaps, which is big receiver in a lot of contested situations probably doesn't get open. I think receivers get t- like body typed uh, mm-hmm. pretty hard. Like yeah. is it, it kind of fill in the gaps with the skill set there, but you know, there are little receivers that win a ton of contested catches and there are big receivers that can get open. I think, Drake London is good enough as a separator for sure, given his size. Again, I think and it, the, the perfect part is like, well, all right, if, if you really can't get open as an outside X receiver, I think you toss him inside and, and that's probably the way he'll, he'll go. But I, yeah, I mean, he's not Nikhil Harry or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that, that eases my worries a little bit. I, I always have Nikhil Harry PTSD, but after I read through her profile, I got a, lo- a lot more comfortable over it. I mean, he's got a 85.2% contested catch rate. So, you know, even if he, let's just say in the worst case, he cannot separate, that's clearly a strength of his and he's able to do that. Um, you know, you think back to the Des Bryant types in the NFL, like there's more than one way to win. I think, you know, the common misconception that I found with people, uh, on, on Twitter or, you know, wherever all these film watchers, you know, self-proclaimed film grinders on, on Twitter, uh, they, they always look for that certain guy, right? When you think about routes and you think about separation, everyone thinks of like a Devonte Smith or like a Keenan Allen, right? Yeah. But like, when I think about it as a very novice film watcher, there are different points to get separation, right? Someone like a Jamar chase is not going to break your ankles and, you know, do a bunch of bunch of swirls and leave, leave defenders on skates. Right. That's not his game, <laughs> yeah. but he still gets separation when it matters, right. When the ball gets to him with his strength, with his, uh, you know, with maybe a, a legit push off or whatever it is. That's what I saw when I see players like Jamar chase, right. They can still get that little bit of separation and in the NFL with the good quarterback. So assuming you're not catching passes from like Trubisky or whatever, like that's all you need. Uh, and if you can win that right. way and you're elite at that and you're better than, you know, 80, 90% of the population at that, that that's a, that's a good thing to have. Right. So that's kind of how I view someone I, like Drake. London. I listed a couple of examples in his profile, you know, like Mike Williams, Brandon Marshall, those guys, yeah. 67.7% success rate. First man, Mike Williams, his most recent season, cause I'm just not there yet is in 2020. Brandon Marshall's was like that great year with the jets where he had, in, I think it was 2016. Yeah. Um, you know, those are like, again, that that's sort of like around that, NFL 50th, you know, percentile separation versus man coverage. But, you know, Mike Williams can make a lot of big plays in the contested area. He can get open as like a, he can make plays in the vertical game because he's a long ass strider. And like, I think Jake Drake London could be that way too. And then there is the like Mike Evans path too, where, Mm -hmm. and I think Mike Evans is like number one example. uh, And, you know, name drop. I talked to, I talked to Mike Evans about this recently. I put the the interview was out uh, on, on Yahoo, I think. I have, I have no idea. I'm pretty sure it was, uh, but he, you know, I talked to him about it. He's a guy that like, people still think he's just a jump ball receiver. Like I remember when <laughs> Brady, when Brady went to Tampa, everybody's like, Oh no, he'll never be able to work with just a jump ball receiver like Mike Evans. Cause he's used to throwing to these little tiny slot guys. And it's like, Jesus Christ. You think like, you think Mike Evans has had a thousand yard seasons. Like <laughs> what is it? Like 15 years in a row at this point <laughs> by never getting open. Like he's got a guy who's over 70% in success rate versus man coverage, but that's like, he's a better player than like a Mike Williams, you know, something like yeah. that. So there are like ranges of outcomes for Drake London. I think it's probably unlikely that he's a Mike Evans type player. I think maybe a Mike Williams type could be more realistic um, or even like a Michael Thomas type. Michael Thomas is like, a much better, like a, he's a great separator and everything like that as a big receiver. Um, but you know, sort of like a, a I think a Brandon Marshall type, I think is my favorite comparison for. Uh, yeah. Drake. I mean, I'll take a Mike Williams as long as he stays healthy. I mean, Mike Williams could right. be great if he just could stay on the field, but every, every time Mike Williams goes up for a catch, it's like, he's in the, like, don't w- land on your back. No, he's don't like, it's like he's back. in the <laughs> WWE and someone is literally choke slamming him uh, yeah. to, to the, to the ground. Um, but yeah, I like that a lot. I think, you know, I love Drake London. Matt Harmon Luxford loves Drake London. Guys, go out there and draft Drake London in your drafts. I don't think you'll be disappointed. I think one player that I'm very interested to get your opinion on, because I just heard that he's in your top tier, and he's probably the most – every year we have a very polarizing player, right? Like the analytics hate him. The, the nerds, we hate him. Oh, yeah. I, he's not good in the spreadsheets. He can't get it done. And then the film guy's like, yo, this guy's a god. This guy's great. Um, and this year, that player – to me, is Jamison Williams. So by all accounts, it seems like he's going to get like first round capital, at least second round draft capital, which is good enough by any metric for me. Um, what are your thoughts on Jameson? Why are you so high on Jameson Williams? What do you think is his trump card? What does he do, do well? What doesn't he do well? Like what is his conditional path to success in the NFL? 
Yeah, there's enough steam on Jamison Williams right now that he might be the first receiver off the board, which mm-hmm. I don't like. You know, I have him number four at the end of my first tier. Like, I would comfortably take Drake London, Chris Olave, and Garrett Wilson ahead of Jamison Williams. I think they probably project, you know, as better pros. That said, the speed factor is is there with Jameson. I mean, you know, he's got great success rate on the vertical routes, of course. Um, you know, I got questions again, like small, small questions as, as a press coverage guy for him. Like he's below Wilson, Olave, London in success rate versus press. Like he's not, uh, and there are some other guys in the class ahead of him too uh, that, you, you know, there are lower tier players. Not that, I mean, again, he's great, great player, but and not to a point that I'm like, man, this is a bad, you know, bad profile at all. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's not quite there in terms of the elite players, his success rate versus press. But so I think there are some like questions about whether he could develop into like a true number one receiver. I think the reason obviously the teams are excited is the speed. You legit see him run by everybody on the defense, at least like two, three times every single game, you know, when, when charting him, watching him, whatever that it is real speed. And I think NFL teams will always fall in love with that. Uh, I also think too, you could talk yourself into for Jamison Williams, like that he has a really great floor actually because if he just becomes like a, a guy who every time he's on the field he dictates coverages and i'm talking about floor from like a, yeah, a, yeah. an nfl perspective not a not a like a, a a fantasy perspective or something like that i think there's a chance like if he ends up being the first receiver off the board and he gets steamed up in dynasty rookie drafts like he might end up being disappointing relative to some of these other guys but from like an nfl team perspective the reason i think they might look at him and be like let's take him as first receiver off the board because you know he could be a guy that dictates coverages just from being on the field you know he could be a guy who makes like two, three big plays uh, in, in huge games and, and wins you, you know, a game all on his own. So I think that's probably the reason he's been steamed up by like traditional film watchers too. I would say I'm kind of like middle of the road uh, actually in terms of like where, like, I don't know. I don't know. I hate him, but I don't love him as much as like film other film guys do, because I do think there are some questions about the technique, about the route running and like whether you can become a full field player, like, you know, other people obviously give out speed comparisons that are like Tyree kill to Sean Jackson. Well, maybe he's more like a Mike Wallace guy and like Mike Wallace mm-hmm. had some good years. I think James Williams can have some good years too, but you know, what is, are we all like looking back at Mike Wallace's career and be like, yeah, I'd take that if I'm the jets at 10th overall, probably. Yeah. Not. yeah. How, how do you think about like, I feel like, you know, every year we, ever since Henry Ruggs, we get in this comparison because someone, someone who's super fast comes out of Alabama yeah. has like a big year and, you know, it was Henry Ruggs. I was not a big fan of him. And then it was Jalen Waddle who I was a big fan of. Um, and then, you know, now it's Jamison Williams. How do you think he, he stacks up to his predecessors in, in like a rugs versus a Jalen Waddle as prospects now that without the hindsight of seeing Jalen Waddle do what he's able been able to do in the middle, I thought Waddle was an awesome prospect. He led all prospects last year in success rate versus man coverage. Just, you know, just a guy who can get open and so fast. And I think Jamison Williams has similar maybe even better pure speed than Jalen Waddle but I think Jalen Waddle could throttle down and control it and I know we're not trying to get into the too big like nerdy like wide receiver talk but that's a huge important thing and like you know Jalen Waddle being able to have success on like comebacks curl routes stuff like that that was why he I think had such a huge year and was such a great prospect because he could really control that speed Jamison's not quite there yet but I would say he's also a comfortably better prospect than Henry Ruggs was. Okay. That's it. I think that helps like put, at least for me, put things in perspective. Um, so he could be a little bit better than Henry Ruggs. I think, you know, a lot of people have PTSD from drafting Henry Ruggs uh, way too early. I was, I was blown away when he was the first wide receiver off the board, but Same. then I, then I saw who picked him. And I'm like, ah, then, yeah, know. then you're like, well, yeah, 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 it's yeah, Raiders. yeah that, that makes sense. It's the Raiders. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting one. And, you know, Alabama, you know, keeps producing wide receivers. So you can't necessarily fade him. but I'm kind of with you. Like I'm a little bit, lukewarm uh, on a Jameson Williams and you know I wish him all the best obviously but I think I prefer some of the better producers um, I want to ask you like so you said you know before we, we started recording you were working on a couple of lesser known guys um, who who's one guy based on your charting so far that you think people should like watch out for uh, that maybe is lesser known that isn't in that top tier uh, but has a chance to kind of make an impact in the NFL yeah I won't give out some of the guys like, you know, Sky Moore and Jahan Dotson, and George Pickens. I think those guys are going to be like round two picks, potentially some of them, maybe two or three of them, two or all three of them sneak into the first round. But like those guys, I really like their RP profiles are good. You can check them out on the site. One guy who's going to be in the rookie roundup post, which will hit the site sometime on Friday, 
uh, that I really like is Khalil Shakir from uh, Boise State. I think he could be like an Amon Ross St. Brown type, uh, just a guy who gets on the field early, very reliable. I think he actually is potentially a bit more like of an explosive man coverage beater than Amon Ra was, but could win in that sort of um, I remember in his uh, RP profile, St. Brown's before the draft, I said like he could thrive in kind of like a, I think I call it, or I know I said this in my dynasty rings, but I said like uh, Bud like Cooper cup role. Like, <laughs> and I think that's, it's funny that he goes to a team with a Rams front office, former Rams front office guy, the former Rams quarterback, Jared Goff. Um, I felt pretty good about that one being in the profile. And I keep calling him now, Bud like Cooper cup. I feel like Khalil Shakir could potentially six. And this was obviously before Cooper cups, like nuclear year. So, yeah, yeah. you know, kind of keep that in perspective. Um, I feel like that uh, Shakir could potentially be sort of in that Bud Light Cooper Cup role too, but might be more of like an explosive uh, man coverage beater. One thing you want to see for these guys that are going to be using the open field, which I think uh, Shakir will. Um, obviously, everybody talks about Debo Samuel. Uh, like it, the, the reason Debo Samuel is just such like an complete freak in the open field is he has like unbelievable contact balance. I think you see some of that in Khalil Shakir too, that he has really great contact balance in the open field to break tackles. That, that's interesting. I think, you know, when you, when you're looking at some of those small school guys, do you, do you kind of take some of their games with a grain of salt? Cause they aren't playing yes. against, you know, top defenders. How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, this has been a big, uh, actually a big question because of Sky Moore, who I just mentioned, like he's number one in success rate versus zone. He's only behind Chris Olave in success rate versus man and press. Um, but I, and I look, I obviously, I think, people have asked like, do you ever take, want to take like strength of scheduling and adjust the metrics? I'm like, no, number one, cause I don't think it will make the product any better Two, I don't like really know wh what I would do. Like, I don't really know where to start with that. Uh, and number three, I feel like it's, an, it should be kind of like inherent. Yes. Like playing at Western Michigan, even though his sample of games did include like his game against Michigan, his game against Pittsburgh, you know, he gets open in those games. Like he, he beats some higher tier teams. You want to obviously say like, you know, you're not going to look at that and be like, okay, he's better than Jamison Williams now, or he's better than Drake London because of this. You want to, I really, especially with uh, prospect evaluation and reception perception, I want to take the data and really use it to like really understand the individual player rather than kind of compare guys to guys uh, because like prospecting is so much more different than just in the NFL. Like I'm totally uh, you know cool with you saying like, all right, Diggs has a better success rate versus man coverage than Michael Thomas or something like that. Like he's better than Michael Thomas. Like I'm fine doing that because I think the NFL level of competition is much more stable, mm -hmm. but for these guys that are small, smaller school players, you know, at Western Michigan, comparing them to like guys that have played in the sec, I feel like, you know, I'm hoping and, you know, I would encourage users and, and, and consumers to like kind of be able to be mindful of that, uh, knowing the guy's profile. Yeah. I, yeah. I totally agree. I mean, it's a totally different game when college and NFL, like that's why, you know, a lot of, a lot of like, if you look at like PFF, like their grades in college don't really mean much, but their grades in NFL is actually like very, very, uh, very, very good just because the level of competition is totally like flattened out. Now, obviously there's like shittier divisions or whatever, but sure. at, at a base level, like, NFL, if you're an NFL DB, like you are fast, athletic, and talented enough to make it on that field. Uh, versus yeah, you, you ain't going against like the Lions for 17 <laughs> games or whatever, yeah. or something like that. But somebody like a Sky Moore might be going against, you know, some guys who aren't even ever going to get like a, a sniff from the freaking USFL or whatever, you know? Yeah. So. Um, so speaking of the NFL, like, you know, your, your website's broken up in the draft prospects and then like the NFL side. So if we look back at 2021, I know you're still kind of like working through, uh, some of that stuff, but who are some, some standouts so far? Uh, like do the old guys still got it? Like, you know, Devonta Adams, the Allen Robinson of the world, who are some of the young guys that like, you know, either lived up to par based on your draft profile or exceeded it or, or, or you know, below it. Like what are some of the, the standout guys when you look back to 2021? Yeah, I think obviously guys like Adams still have it. Um, you know, he's it's going to be really fascinating to see like how these wide receiver trades age, you know, like an Adams or a Hill type. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be like the at some point I need to do just like a brain dump podcast about like all of these wide receiver moves that have happened uh, because not an article. Nobody reads articles. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I need to do that in like an audio form at some point. Uh, but, yeah, I think uh, even an Allen Robinson type like 
I, I'm still very bullish on him. I think he could give you like two top 15 seasons the next couple of years as the wide receiver two uh, in LA. I think he can still get open. I think he could still separate off the line of scrimmage and be an explosive player. So still very bullish on him. Um, you know, the young guys, like that's kind of the next tier of players that are, are going to hit the site. Like after these prospects are wrapped up, the mm-hmm. guys that were rookies last year, 2021, those guys are going to hit the site. And, you know, luckily uh, November me, did this April me a favor, which, you know, I put published the rookie report this past year. So I've got four games of everybody already in the sample and the may me that's getting married in May <laughs> really appreciates that. <laughs> but I think two guys, obviously, like I still hold a lot of high hopes for uh, are Rashad Bateman and Elijah Moore. I think their rookie year mid season uh, samples were really good. And I'm excited to kind of see what the rest of the, their samples hold. Cause those are two guys I think can, really develop into you know not maybe not potential number one receivers but really really good receivers love to hear that Rashad Bateman uh is my prince um I I, I mean yes. he I, I love him as a prospect I think you know he didn't really get a fair shot I was so sad when he got injured because I wanted to see him yeah. develop like right from the jump and just like kind of get into things so I'm excited to see what he does this year like speaking of Vonta Adams his reception perception chart it's is like stupid. Ab- is absolutely yeah. bonkers. It's like there's there's no yellows. It's just all green, all green. He just yeah. wins all the time, no matter what the route is. Doesn't matter if it's a nine route, a post route, a dig route. I mean, yeah, short, long, medium. He's like 99th percentile against press coverage, which doesn't shock me because correct me if I'm wrong here. Devonta Adams has probably one of the best releases, yeah, uh, in the NFL. Like the, he's he's insane uh, on on any of those routes. So he's he's incredible. Uh, I'm excited to see what they do. Uh, yeah. in Oakland I think I think like you know with that oh, t- drink that- you said you said Oakland bro uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry I uh, I meant I meant Vegas but I, you know, I know I, I'm still I'm still uh, I'm a Bay Area native so um, uh, that's true I'm not native I wouldn't sorry. put I, I wouldn't put I wouldn't put Devonte Adams and obviously in the reception perception hall of fame but I think he's my favorite like player to talk about because like you mentioned he's been at this like 99th percentile level for four straight years which is yeah. insane considering that his rookie year was is one of the f- was awful i mean <laughs> like and it wasn't just like oh he's dropping the shit out of the ball or like aaron Rodgers pissed him or whatever um like he he was terrible he couldn't get open he couldn't separate i mean he's literally gone from like the first percentile to the 99th percentile like from yeah. the bottom all the way to the top like nobody does that you go back and look at like the the guys who aren't slot receivers yeah you know that are among like the five worst players it's you know it's like marquis lee it's like justin hunter like these guys mm-hmm. that flame out of the league and then there's Devonte adams like so it is pretty crazy um this that that just jump is this unprecedented and i mean i guess it would the Jalen Rager fans, maybe I guess could, could look because he's the <laughs> he's the second worst uh, success rate first man ever. Uh, but I don't I don't see that happen. I don't yeah, I don't that. don't give us don't give us that hope. But yeah, he he's got to be the greatest comeback ever from reception perception history. I think the other guy you mentioned, Allen Robinson, I'm still very bullish on, on him as well. He's still ranking in the 96th percentile against press, so you know he can still get it done. The one thing with Allen Robinson, I've noticed this year over year, he's always struggled against zone. Right. Yeah. Why it's interesting? Is that? Why is that? I don't really know. I think that uh, there, like especially this this past year, you could maybe put that on. And this year was really bad. Um, and I think you could maybe put that on like a, a lot of different things. This past year was one of those like everything that could go wrong would go wrong for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but like he's really, I think he's a great technician and he's so good at breaking off routes against man coverage. But um, you know especially as he's gotten older that that has been something in his profile that like against zone coverage stuff like that i'm interested to see uh with him with sean mcveigh because um he's been like you know just pumping out zone beaters like yeah. uh, cooper cup uh like uh, even robert woods too obviously like that x receiver role though that's gonna be alan robinson's and like you know Odell Beckham showed like the value of that X receiver role that it can unlock in the offense. And um, even Brandon cooks before that, it's like Brandon cooks is not like Allen Robinson level player. I mean, Brandon cooks is really good player, but he's not like Allen Robinson level. He's not like Odell Beckham at his peak level, but man, it was like when Brandon cooks got hurt in that, when he was in that offense and like, especially when he got traded away and like, I understand why they had to make that trade that offense, like missed a a speed X receiver. And I think Robinson is going to be a big part of that. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see how that kind of shapes out in, in the next year. Um, so that's that's all the main football talk. I just want to end up on a couple of fun questions, but you know, you've interviewed a bunch of people, right? Uh, I don't want to force you to choose a favorite, but I'm gonna force you to choose a favorite. <laughs> Who is the favorite player? Who's your favorite interviewed player so far in your career? 
Uh, yeah, I, I talked about Diggs. Like he's always, he's really cool. He owes me a game of Mario Kart, by the way, which I would <laughs> kick his ass in. Uh, but that's a the separate discussion. Uh, and but I would say my the favorite player I've ever interviewed is actually it's probably it's probably it's probably Derrick Henry because he's yeah, the nicest player. He's the nicest player I've ever interviewed. The king, um, dude. He's he's the only player after an interview was over that just like legit gave me a real hug. Like not a, not a bro <laughs> hug, not like a one of these or anything, like a real, just embrace. And I like kind of, I mean, he's just a great, he's just a great guy. Super, super nice player to talk to everything like that. Um, yeah. I would say, I would say he was, he's my favorite just cause I, he was like unexpectedly just, just a great, a great person. What's it feel like to get embraced by a real life Titan, like liter- a literal Titan. I mean, I'm actually a pretty tall guy, uh, <laughs> but I feel like a, like, <laughs> like a significant little squirrel. So yeah, it was, it's pretty unbelievable. Yeah. That's I awesome. actually, I actually bumped like in the hug, I like kind of bumped into his little uh, ponytail thing. And I was like, Oh my God, I hope I don't like ruin the, the source of his power. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see King Henry come back and do his thing uh, this season. Uh, so it's super dope to hear, like, you know, get the backstory of like, these guys are, you know, humble and they're nice, even though they're, yeah. on the big screen uh you know literally stomping on men um what about uh, fantasy leagues Who, who's the best player you've ever played against in your fantasy leagues whether that's redraft dynasty doesn't matter who's who's the guy that you that gives you you know that just makes you go damn i can't fucking beat this guy oh man um that's a tough one. Cause I feel like now I play in just like, uh, just mostly like writer leagues. So mm-hmm. like everybody's really good. <laughs> I don't have a really good, you know, um, I don't really have like a, you know, a good like home league or anything like that. Uh, but like every league I'm in with JJ Zacharies and I feel like he's, Oh my God. <laughs> I, feel like he's, I feel like he's just, he never has, I have some teams that absolutely tank out. Like, yeah. and I'll, I'm, I'm cool with saying that, you know, like some teams that like just, fucking suck <laughs> and like i mean terrible terrible teams and it just happens you know um but you know you you, you go uh alan robinson round three after <laughs> doing antonio gibson around two and brandon Ayuk in round six like yeah you're gonna have some bad teams <laughs> um they came back all right though antonio gibson and yeah you could be and we made we made the playoffs and yeah in, in, in a couple spots there so you know you never give up but yeah every year i feel like jj's got a good a good to great team a good to great team yeah, you're you're not the first person that has uh said JJ as the as the guy that's come on the show. So <laughs> it seems like uh, everyone sees him in the same light. You know, one of the one of the true goats of the industry. Um, all right. So I mean, that's that's all I got for the show. Uh, in terms of content, you know, before we exit, uh, just just let the viewers know uh, where to find you, how to support you. I'll have all the links in the comments below, but just just let them know how to holler at Matt Matt Harmon and how to support uh, your work going forward. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Matt Harmon underscore BYB. Uh, and you can subscribe reception perception.com got three tiers of pricing. So I like to think there's something for everybody. You know, there's like the full on sicko package. Literally that's what it's called. Cause you gotta be a sicko to, to want to be this nice, nice. We love it. Uh, you know, that's where you get like the full access to all RP data and like some exclusive, like, you know, one-on-one stream stuff during the year. Uh, and then obviously we've got like some, the basic pricing tier where you just get like my redraft rankings and like access to profiles. Like that's like, just tell me who you like, basically. That's the, that's the basic tier. So yeah, one, one other everybody. selling point for your, for your sicko tier is uh, Matt has a sortable data. So for, for all the nerds out there like me that like to get an Excel and a CSV download and start sorting like by contested catch rate, by, you know, man versus man versus press versus zone and start sorting shit and, and finding your different tier cutoffs of what you define as a, as a successful player, that's a big reason to get the uh, Seiko tiers, to get that data. So for those of you guys out there better salesman like me, than me. Uh, yeah, those the, don't want to sell yourself short. That's that's a big, big piece, and it, it's key because it, it goes back, and you can you can test the data, and then the shit works. That's all I can say. The shit works. Go buy it. Go pay for it. Go support Matt. Go support his work. Uh, I've been a big fan, you know, ever since before I was even doing any fantasy content creation, uh, and it's been uh, been a long time coming. I'm so happy to finally have had the chance to interview, you know, chop it up and talk football with you. Uh, it's definitely been uh, been on that my little fantasy bucket list, and so I can check that off and retire and fully retire and there right off go. the sunset yeah. in peace. So I appreciate you coming on the show. Appreciate you giving me the time, uh, giving the folks the time. I'm sure everyone will will appreciate this episode. I, I learned a lot for sure, and uh, you know, hopefully you enjoyed yourself as well. And uh, you oh, know, yeah, good absolutely. luck in the in the upcoming draft. 
uh, the season. Good luck with uh, your marriage. Hopefully, you know, the <laughs> wedding all goes without a hitch uh, perfectly. Thank you. And, yeah. uh, you know, you ride off into the draft and married sunset. Uh, that's what I hope for you guys. Uh, and, you. Uh, yeah, just thank you again for coming on, man. It's been, it's been a blast uh, having you on the show. And I couldn't ask for a, for a better, uh, better partner to kind of just, uh, you know, go off here. Hell yeah, man. This was awesome. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, you, you really did the Tom Brady thing where you're like, you can, you, can you really call her? It was like an extended vacation, you know, it was basically <laughs> what Brady took basically uh, what you did to hear. So no, I appreciate you coming back and uh, hanging out with me, man. This is an awesome conversation. And yeah, um, I, I, I want to be as bullish about like Drake London, be able to separate as like, a, we're going to have a smooth wedding here. On <laughs> yeah, let's so. do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Drake London success, Matt Harmon success. We're here for it. 2022. That's what we're all about. All right. All right, guys, that's all I got for you guys this week. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, make sure you keep subscribing to the BDG channel. Support the rest of the squad, Nick, Noah, uh, and, and uh, you know, Animal and Snacks and everyone at the BDG team. This is the last you'll see of me, I promise. I, I said I would come back for this episode uh, because I could not could not go out without talking uh, to uh, to Matt Harmon. So uh, it's been great. It's been it's been cool. And uh, and I'll catch you guys on the other side. How's it going? All right, peace out.